Romans chapter 4. The message translation begins at verse 16 and reads this way. This is why the fulfillment of God's promise depends entirely on trusting God and his way. And then simply embracing him in what he does. God's promise arrives as pure gift. That's the only way everyone can be sure to get in on it. Those who keep the religious traditions are those who have never heard of them. For Abraham is father of us all. He's not our racial father. That's reading the story backwards. He's our faith father. We call Abraham father not because he got God's attention by living like a saint, but because God made something out of Abraham when he was a nobody. Isn't that what we've always read in the scripture? God saying to Abraham, I set you up as father of many peoples. Abraham was first named father and then became a father because he dared to trust God to do what only God could do, raise the dead to life with a word make something out of nothing. When everything was hopeless, Abraham believed anyway, deciding to live not on the basis of what he saw, he couldn't do it, but on what God said he would do. And so he was made father of multitudes of people. God himself said to him, you're going to have a big family, Abraham. Abraham didn't focus on his own impotence and say it's hopeless. This 100-year-old body could never father a child, nor did he survey Sarah's decades of infertility and give up. He didn't tiptoe around God's promise asking cautiously skeptical questions. He plunged into the promise and came up strong, ready for God. Sure that God would make good on what he said. That's why it is said Abraham was declared fit before God by trusting God to set him right. You may take your seats in the presence of God. May God be glorified as people be edified and the devil be horrified. We call Abraham father not because he got God's attention by living like a saint, but because God made something out of Abraham when he was a nobody. Just look at somebody and tell them this dream can't die. This dream can't die. In 1966, Compton, California native and resident, Maxie D. Filer, graduated from the now closed Van Norman University, located in Los Angeles. And in that time after he graduated, he sat down for his first crack to take the California bar exam. It was his dream to become a lawyer, having lived through the civil rights era and seeing the injustices of African Americans that have been handed down as a result of the American justice system and the dominant culture. And this three-day test, considered one of the toughest in the nation that day, got the best of him. He took it and he failed. As a matter of fact, it got the best of him a record 48 times before he realized his dream. From that first time, Filer attempted to make it through the bar exam. He made a habit of taking the bar exam once or twice a year. His sons, in elementary school, the first time he took the test, graduated from law schools themselves. 
they both passed the exam on their very first try and they began practicing law themselves before their father could join them in the ranks. But after 48 tries, 47 of them failures, 25 years after his first unsuccessful attempt, in 1991 he passed at 60 years old. After raising sons who went on to become lawyers before him, he passed. After giving up long ago, but still going back at it where he rightfully could have said, I'm done with it, he passed. After everyone else had moved on and he had settled into a law clerk position for the city of Los Angeles, he passed all because he possessed a dream that would not die. The two biggest questions that you and I will ever have to answer and will haunt us all of our lives are, do I quit or do I persevere? Do I hold on or do I let go? If you're like me, invariably you have found out that there have been times in your life when you have realized that you have quit all too soon dreams that you may have had as a younger person, things that you had hoped to accomplish at a younger time in life somehow have escaped and you look back and wonder what if I had continued or given it another try. Many of us have put our lot in lives on hold and we're just marking time in our existence instead of pursuing something greater for us for good reason because it's heartbreaking to have a dream. It's heartbreaking because we live in a world that specializes in killing dreams and those who have dreams. We found that out again this week when we looked on the television and saw number 45, the commander in tweet. Who made moves once again to secure his legacy of someone who takes away and does not give. We decided he was going to set limits on the deferred action for childhood arrivals programs in which people who have vision for more than their lives and even for their children are now in danger of having their dreams destroyed simply because of a leader who's happy to kill other people's dreams. This world will take our hopes, it will take our dreams, it will laugh at them at the face of reality, the reality of race and class and privilege and poverty. And just like Mr. Fowler, we find ourselves in our lives somehow looking up saying that we're not living up to the dream we have in our life. But what happens, CW, when you have a dream that just won't leave you alone? When you've come to the end of your situation, when you've done all that you can do, and you've said that this is all that can be done, and you tried to settle in to moving on, but it still haunts you in your reality. The irony is that even though we live in the midst of a dream-killing world, a real dream won't die. When I've given myself every good and rational reason as to why it can't happen, everything that I've tried and seen that it has not gone my way, sometimes, just like acid reflux, the dream keeps coming back up. And I came to talk to somebody today who says everything but God is telling me this is over, even me. And I'm here to tell you that's all that you really need. That all you really need is God telling you it ain't over yet. Jesus felt the pain of this. The mission was unaccomplishable. I know that's not a word, but it makes theological sense. His mission was not able to be accomplished. His disciples had left him. 
The religious leaders of the time seem to be winning, and he's up on a cross asking God, why have you forsaken me? What I thought was going to happen, what I felt was going to take place is not happening. He knows the pain of looking at life, wondering if the dream is going to be fulfilled. Everything points to this thing never happening in your life. Everything looks like it's not going to take place. And the feeling is that it will never take place in your life, but it just won't leave you alone. Something reminds you of what you had planned to do 20 years ago. Something nudges you when you see somebody else walking in that which you had originally put your mind to do. And even when you said that you've given up and you're not going to do it, a real dream won't let you live without it. How many of us have put our dreams into Neverland and let them die? Neverland, the place in which you said it'll never happen. I'll never be able to graduate from school. I'll never be able to raise my kids in admonition and fear of the Lord. I'll never be able to make a decent wage. I'll never be able to whatever it is, fill in the blank. We put our dreams into Neverland, and that's the place where dreams die. And it'd be easier just to leave it there and give up and move on. But dreams just won't die. It's frustrating. Because I wish that the dream would just leave me alone in my impotence because I've tried it too many times and I can't get it to work in my life. And it would be better if my dream just let me alone. I, 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 the, the wonderful thing or the sad thing, whichever way you want to look at it is about dreams, is that even when you sleep and try to get away from them, that's when they show up the most. Some of us have been asleep at the wheel a mighty long time. Some of us have been lulled into sleep. And it's in our sleeping that we begin to wonder and ask the question, what if I give it another try? And by God, I, I could deal with Mr. Filer himself if, if, if he quit after five or six tries. But what makes somebody do it the 45th time? What is somebody holding on to the time after time? I mean, their family had to see it as an annual event that daddy always fails. He's always, he's still at it until one day the mail came in. The envelope was a little thicker than it was where it said we regret to inform you, but now he had a thicker envelope all because that dream wouldn't leave him alone. Who am I preaching here to this morning that God is saying you need to pick up that dream once again because you've not lived long enough to let go. You're not qualified to quit yet. You don't have the credentials to throw in the towel. You're not qualified to say, I've come to the end of my rope. As long as you got breath in your body, as long as God has given you another day, as long as God has raised you up from your bed, then you got another day to give it another try. And I dare somebody to laugh in the devil's face and say, it may not have worked last time, but I'm not going to quit on my dream. That's what this text is trying to get into our mind today. By reminding us of the story of Abraham. And Paul himself, the writer, the apostle, brings this story up to people who are in the midst of all kinds of degradation. Here they are, first century church, trying to be what God had called them to be. In the crucible of conflict and uh, 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 critique and misunderstanding. Literally, lives were on the line because of their faith. And he wants them to understand that, that whatever is happening in their lives, that faith in God somehow would take them to where God has called them to be. And Paul is writing to encourage their faith not to waver because just like Abraham had to be strong in the face of adversity and overwhelming odds, when you and I are strong just like that, we walk in the same kind of faith 
that he admired and was able to acquire when he first was able to know God himself. You understand, Abraham was the father of the faith. And because it is he who first believed God when others did not, others who come after him when they believe like he believed, are able to walk in the same kind of promise and understand God the same way that he understood him when he trusted God even when he could not trace him. God came to him. God told him in the words of the translation known as the message, you're going to have a big family. This is an outrageous claim and promise, but God said it anyhow. Even though both Abraham and his wife had passed the age when they were physically possible to produce children and they had failed all of these other times to be able to make it happen, God said it's still going to happen in your life. It was the dream of every man who got married to have children that would somehow carry their name on after they were gone on this earth. Particularly a son that would be able to walk in the ways of their father. And all of these years up until the age in which he was, there was nothing he could show as proof of him walking on this earth to see that he was somebody significant. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us in the text is explicit to say that in the eyes of everybody and probably Abraham himself, he was a nobody. Nobody was looking for him. Nobody was paying attention to him. He had nothing to show for nearly 100 years on this earth. And all of a sudden, he finds and meets a God who says, I'm going to not only bless you, but I'm going to bless those who do bless you. And I'm going to make your name great and give you so many children that even the stars in the sky will not outnumber them and the sand on the the beach will not outshine it. Somebody needs to be able to praise God that even in your darkest moments, even in your most significant hours of distress and need, God can still show up and show you that there's another way that even though it may look dark, even though it may be grim, even though you may not feel like you're going to make it, God still has another word and one word from God will turn your life all the way around. I wish I could tell somebody somebody here who's wallowing in their faith that if you just hold on a little bit longer God's going to see you through he's old shooting blanks his wife is postmenopausal. there's no reason for him to embrace it but somehow he trusts God and the Bible says because he believed God, listen, listen, uh, God gave him credit for a class he didn't sign up for. It was accredited to him for righteousness. He got an A in righteousness even though he didn't sign up for the class because he trusted God. And God let him audit the class of righteousness simply because he trusted God when he couldn't do it himself. God's going to give you something more just when you trust him that even going through this mess that looks like it's going to take it out of your life. God says, I'm going to bless you with something extra because you trusted me. Come on, give God glory and say thank God for that promise. What this text is trying to teach us and show us is that if we exhibit likewise, likewise qualities with our own faith, that when faced with reasons to give up on life, we too will experience what we have and need to hold on to something greater beyond ourselves. That, that God will give you the ability to move on past. And that's why this dream won't die. That's why you're still haunted with the possibility of greatness in the midst of chaos. That's why we are still thinking of something even right now. What if I went on back and gave it another try? Because this dream can't die. Despite us living in a world that will kill dreams, 
unless we depend on God to do what we can't do, you and I will quit too soon and our dreams won't be realized. Tell somebody, don't quit, don't quit, don't quit. So, so I hear your question. Dougie, how, how, how does God expect us to take steps toward a highly improbable destiny when everything but God says it's over? How does God expect me to continue to prepare for the bar exam in my life when I failed 47 times in a row? Why won't this dream just die? First thing I want to share with you, this dream can't die, number one, because of the author of the dream. Look at the text. The text, the text says in verse 18 that God, God is saying to Abraham, I set you up as father of many peoples. Don't, don't overlook that. The Bible says God said the Abraham. The Bible doesn't say Abraham went to God and said, I have a prayer, I have an idea. God, would you set me up as a father to many peoples? That I've been going through this so long and I think there needs to be a change in my life. And God, I have a request for you. This is what I want you to do. If it be your will, would you do this in my life? No, the Bible said God came to Abraham and said, I'm going to set you up. Don't you understand that all of your previous failures have just set you up for what God wants to do with your future and your destiny? You thought it was to take you down, but God sent me by here to tell somebody it's a setup. Every time you've been denied, every time it's been brought down, every time you couldn't get it to work, every time it looked like it wasn't going to happen, God said, I got to let you go through it in your own strength long enough so you'll finally be able to see, can't nobody do it but me. I set you up for victory. But, but see here, see here in the text, the text says it's not Abraham's dream. He's not the one who has the dream. He's not the one who has the idea. And the reason why this dream can't die is because God is the one who gave him the dream. It's God's dream for Abraham. It's God's idea for Abraham. It's God saying, this is what I want to do with your life. And there's a difference between a good idea and a God idea. And you might have many good ideas that didn't make it in your life. But when you have a God idea that you didn't even sign up for, but the Lord just opened up a door in your life, God says, I put my name on it and can't no devil in hell or nigga grow on earth. Keep this dream from being realized in your life. I don't care if you failed a hundred times. That 101st time is going to come to pass because it's my dream. It can't fail because it's not your dream. It's God's dream. And it's just getting to the place. I know we're getting to the place where we're just sure now. We got to be sure of something. But the bottom line is you'll never be sure. That's why you need faith. Sometimes you're just walking, wondering, am I going in the right direction? But the bottom line, if God is in it, it's got to come to pass. And sometimes you can only take one step. You're trying to see 10 steps down the road and God is saying just trust me with one more step because some of you are just one step away from your victory but because you're trying to see 10 steps down the road you won't take one more step with God but I come by to tell you that if you take one step God will take two and he'll open up a door and bless you come on give God glory in this place This dream can't die because of the author of the dream. The whole gospel is built on the fact that God's dream for humanity cannot die. Can you imagine the despair, the pain that the disciples felt when they watched Jesus 
die in their face? Can you imagine what they felt like having dedicated their lives, having left all to follow him, to watch their dreams literally be crushed in front of them? Can you imagine what it was like to see this man who had given life to others die in front of them? To see the one who had given sight to others have to close his eyes? To see the one who had been able to give power to others lose power in his own body and have to be limped from the cross, limping or rather lumped up in a body with no life in it and laid in a tomb sent there to die. Every hope was crushed for them. Every dream was now unrealized. That's why they forsook him and fled. That's why they said, listen, we'll just go back to what we were doing before. But three days later, God said, this dream can't die. And when he got up with all power of heaven and earth, there was a signal and a sign to every adversarial force on this earth and below that no matter what you're facing on this earth, when God has a dream, it doesn't matter how far you try to keep it down. Sooner or later, it's got to get back up. And that's why your dream keeps haunting you. That's why I won't leave you alone because God put it in your DNA when you were so little a long time ago that you are somebody and I got bigger plans for your life and this dream can't die because God is the author of your dream. He who begun a good work in you shall perform it unto the day of Christ's return. He's the author and the finisher of your faith. Look at somebody and say he's going to finish what he started. He's going to finish what he put in you. He's going to keep on putting up with you even when you go through your valley time. He's going to keep on being with you even when you want to give up and throw in the towel. He's going to keep on even when you and I want to stop where we are. Somebody needs to praise God that he didn't give up on you 15 years ago. And the reason why you're still in the room one more time is because he's got a dream for your life that's bigger than your own imagination. And if you could just trust God for one more step and thank him that he's the author of it. You'll find yourself going to where God said you were going to go. If I'm right about it, tell somebody hallelujah. This dream can't die because of the author of the dream. It's God's dream. I know you thought you came up with it. I know you thought you had a good idea. That idea just came out of nowhere. I sound like God. Stepped out of nowhere. Stood on nothing. Said, let there be. Then there was. God comes out of nowhere. Anytime you got an idea out of nowhere, God gave you the idea. And this dream continues to haunt you, continues to haunt me because it can't die and it can't die because of the author of the dream. See here, secondly, that this dream can't die not, not just because of the author of the dream but secondly because of the audacity of the dream. I, I like the way Eugene Peterson translates the original language. He says in verse 18, when everything was hopeless, Abraham believed anyway. Deciding not to live on the basis of what he saw he couldn't do, but on what God said he would do. This dream has um, some testicular fortitude. It's got some nerve. Because this dream goes against hope. 
people all around Abraham believed in something, probably as fervently as he believed in his God, but their experience was limited because, not because of the strength of their belief, but who they believed in. Because you can have a lot of faith in thin ice and find out it won't hold you up. But you can have a little faith in thick ice and find out that it holds you up all the way even though you weren't understanding how it was being done. And belief sometimes is nothing more than empty superstition. But a faith that knows what it is trusting in ultimately understands that your faith has to be subject to the one you're trusting in. And the one that you're trusting in has given an incredible claim that says I'm going to do something that cannot physically be done. Didn't even need doctors in that time. Did not even need anybody of medical expertise to say this could not be done. The facts were there in their face. It was physically impossible for the human being to produce anything to come of substance out of it. And really, the more miraculous thing is not just Abraham being able to produce the seed, but what about Sarah carrying the seed? 99 years old, carrying and producing a child after all of this time. Miraculousness is all over this, and that's the audacity of this dream. To look impossibility in the face to look at situations that clearly say on paper it'll never be done to look at situations that everybody turns their backs on and say it'll never happen in your life and say yes it's going to happen anyhow I tell you this dream can't die because it's got some audacity it's really, the audacity is wrapped up in this. This dream can't die because it's bigger than your problem. See, the problem we have is that we think our problems are so big and we don't have a dream that will conquer the problem that we have. And we come to the end of our own ropes and the end of our own abilities. And when we come to the end of ourselves and see that we can't do it and it can't be done anymore, then that's when we be determined that because we've done everything that it can never happen in our life. But the everything that we've done has only exhausted us. We haven't even begun to try God. We haven't begun to trust him in an area that we've not really given over to him. We've not really begun to trust him in an area that we've not even really started to walk down. We try to figure it out. We try to imagine it out. We try to purchase our way out. We try to control our way out. We try to find people that we know that can help our way out. But we find ourselves still in a situation where physically, humanly, emotionally, it can't be done. But I'm trying to tell somebody it's not till you get to the end of yourself and that you find yourself at the beginning of God because at the end of your own rope is when you find yourself needing something more powerful than the degrees on your wall, more powerful than the money in your bank account, bigger than the home that you live in, better than the clothes you can put on your back, more than the people you know that you can rub elbows and shoulders with because you need something bigger than the problem that you're facing. And the reason why some of us are here in the room right now is because we came here on the Sunday morning that even though we're not in the Caribbean and we're not down in Houston, we still had a tsunami. We still had hurricanes come into our lives and wipe out so much in our existence and we're looking for somebody to give us some help because our problem looks bigger than our dream. But you got to understand that just like down in the Caribbean and in Florida after the storm has gone away. Somebody will show up and say let's build it all over again. I don't care if I got to start with one centimeter of wood. I don't care if I got to start with one tile. I'm not going to let that previous storm be the, the ruin of my life. But if I got to start with nothing, if I ain't got nothing left, I'll start where I am and build it to a bigger thing. Is there anybody here in the room that says I know what it's like to have everything 
been wiped out from me, but the audacity of the dream that says even when I ain't got nothing, I still got God. And as long as I got God, I got everything I need. This dream is bigger than your problems. This dream is bigger than your disappointments. This dream is bigger than your dilemmas. Don't settle for being on this wrong side of contentment when you have not succeeded yet and say this is just what things are going to be in my life. Because when you think about it, you really have no other choice but to pick yourself up from whatever failure you're in and give it another try in your life. Abraham had nothing else to choose but God. He didn't have anything else. And somewhere on the inside of us, we've got to believe that God is going to show up somewhere and turn this thing around. You keep reading the text that it says when he considered his circumstances on one hand, the Bible uses a particular word to talk about his consideration. A strong word that, 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 that talks about what it could look like on one hand and what it could look like on another hand. Our problem is we only look at one hand. We look at the hand that holds the problem, but we don't look at the hand that holds the solution. But when you put both hands together, I wish I had a praying church. You'll find that sometimes you got to fall to your knees when you put your problem with your solution and ask God to come and help you. Abraham must have been tempted to sink into despair when he considered the promise of God as it related to his circumstance that it had to excite him. And here he is caught between two worlds. Got my problem and I got what God says. And the tendency would be to vacillate between the two extremes. But the Bible says emphatically he refused to do that. Preferring instead to trust God to work through the intermittent delays and disappointments. That what he could not do is not what he focused on, but he focused on what God said he would do. And you can be miserable on your road to contentment or you can be faithful on your road to purpose. Do you just want to sit around and pay bills and look for something better to happen in your life? Or do you finally want to live a life of purpose in the existence God has given you? This dream won't die because there's something on the other side of your disappointment that God wants you to embrace. And even though we got situations in our lives that will pull us down, it will cause us to say, well, I'm just going to settle right here. But don't be like Moses who was consent on the wrong side of the mountain until God had to come get him. Don't be like Jeremiah who said, I'm fine tearing up my ordination certificate and I'm not going to preach anymore. Don't be like Peter who said, I'm going to go back to being a fisherman all because this dream didn't work out for me you've got to understand that on the other side of every disappointment on the other side of every failure that you find yourself in is a God somewhere who says I can still turn dark yesterdays into bright tomorrows and if you trust me through the mess in your life I'll take even this mess because I audacity, I have the unmitigated gall, I have the nerve, I have the testicular fortitude to tell your problems where to go and how to get there. I'm God all by myself and I don't need nobody's help. Is there anybody in the room and says that's the kind of God I serve? I'm almost done. This thought continues to move along in the story in the text that Paul is sharing as in making possible the provision of offspring despite the deadness of Abraham and Sarah in their existence. They were dead. Uh, there was no prescription. that could help him 
was not enough makeup to make her look <laughs> like she used to. <laughs> it was dead, Reverend. It was. Listen, but God has said in the text, he said to be the one who calls things that are not as though they were. Watch this, watch this. Calls things that are not as though they were. Watch, watch, watch this. Not, not, just, not just calls things that are not as though they are. You missed it. You missed it. I'm going to talk to some people over here. Not just call things that are not as, as they are. But God's calling is so strong, it'll call you to what you were. Oh, I, I wish I had some honest folk that would know when to shout in here. Because some of our dreams escaped us. They say that youth, that, 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 that youth is wasted on the young. That, 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 that once you get your wisdom, once you get your mind right, at an older age, you just ain't got the energy to get it done anymore in your life. And you wish that you knew then what you know now, but you don't have the energy to get it done. But God says, I've got a calling on your life that'll look at your life and not call you as you are, but call you as you are were. I, I can give you the power to go in a now situation, but you can face it with the same energy as you were because my calling is strong enough to go through the power in your life and call you to greatness no matter what you're facing right now. Somebody near you to praise God and thank him for power that comes from on high and thank him that he's got a calling that'll go into your past and make everything in your future right. God will call you to what you were. The word literally means to summons. It literally means to call into being. It's used for his sense of creative activity. That, that Isaac was a real existence in the purpose of God before he was begotten. Abraham couldn't see him yet. It didn't mean that he wasn't already existent. Abraham didn't have him in his hand yet. It didn't mean that it wasn't in God's design or his plan. What well, I'm trying to tell somebody that he's calling you to what's already present in your life. And you just can't see it in your life yet. And just because you can't see it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It just means you can't see it. That, that, that's the reason why you and I need faith. Because faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. I can't see it yet. I, 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 don't, I, I can't even imagine it happening. But just because you can't see it with your natural eye doesn't mean that God hasn't already planned for it to happen in your life. And that's why when you close your eyes, that, that's why when you're lulled to sleep sometimes in your life, you begin to dream. Because in your dreams, you're able to see some things that you can't see with your naked eye. In your dreams, you're able to see some things. You're able to see your life in a better situation. You're able to see yourself overcoming. You're able to see yourself in some certain situations. And what the devil tries to do is give you a nightmare to scare you back to your reality and try to keep you trapped in where you are. But somehow, you see something greater than what you have right now. And because you've seen it in a different realm, you're saying, I cannot stop until this dream comes true because this dream just won't leave me alone. And because this dream has audacity, it's just going to keep on haunting us because this dream's author is God himself. It just won't leave us alone. But in the last instance, I want to share with you the reason why this dream will not die is because of the angle of the dream. The Bible says that God himself said to Abraham, you're going to have a big family. He didn't say, Abraham, I'm just going to bless you. He didn't say, Abraham, I'm just going to do something in your life. But he said, Abraham, I got plans that go beyond your own life. In other words, you have lived up to this moment and you're looking for a blessing only to be resident in your years of experience. But God sent me by here to tell you that what I have planned for you 
Your life ain't long enough to be able to house all the blessings I have to bestow in your life. That's the reason why this dream can't die. Because God doesn't give 80-year dreams. God doesn't give 90-year dreams. God doesn't give years that only dry up after 100 years on this earth. But when God gives a dream, it's an everlasting dream. It's a dream that will go into your existence and speak to everything that came before you. And speak to everything that's got to come after you. And this dream is meant to outlive your own life. What I'm trying to tell tell somebody is that God gives it to you, but it's for something greater than yourself. And what the Lord has sent me by here to tell somebody is the reason why this dream won't leave you alone is because he's got more in store for your future than you have seen in your past. And you cannot give up right now on your road. You cannot stop where you are in your road of destiny right now because too much has happened for your situation. Too much has caused you to get where you are. And God sent me by to let somebody know that there's really been a setup in your life. And the reason why the devil's been so hard on you, and the reason why it looks like it just cannot be done, is because God's getting ready to show you the greater part of his glory. And if you can just trust God one more time in your own situation, you're going to see him be able to open up a door that you thought was closed forever in your life. But if you trust him in the places where you saw your failure, right there in your failure is where God's going to turn it around. That's why he let your enemies gather. That's why he let people see your failure. That's why he let people hear about it on social media. That's why you went through the public humiliation. That's why it looked like it wasn't going to happen because he wants to gather everybody around because everybody loves to come to a car crash. They love to slow down their work wake when they're in traffic going somewhere to see what's happening in somebody else's life and they want to see the carnage and the destruction but the reason why the Lord let it be set up in your life is so when the carnage was all gone and the mess was made right there your enemy would still be around and you'd be able to show your enemy look how far God has brought me maybe that's the reason why David said you prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemy. Am I right about it? So you ought to just go ahead and embrace where you are. Go ahead and give God glory for where you are because you've been set up because God's got an angle that the enemy can't see. He sees you in your destruction but God sees you in your elevation he sees you in your past but God sees you in your future he sees you as it is right now but God sees you as he's called you to be give your neighbor high five and tell your neighbor that God will make a way out of no way, find another neighbor that was a wrong neighbor. Shake them by the hand and tell them God will make a way out of no way. Is there anybody in the room that knows what it's like to face no way, to be in a mess and can't find your way out? But I'm a living witness. If you trust God, he'll open up a window that was not there. He'll give you power that you did not have. He'll give you strength that you cannot fathom. Am I right about it? Give your neighbor high Five. And tell him, won't he do it? Won't he do it? Won't he pick you up? Won't he turn you around? Won't he do it for you? Say yeah! Say yeah! 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 Listen. Listen, I'm closing, I'm closing. Listen. Listen, I'm closing. I, I, I don't want to shout this because I want you to get this. I, I want to I, I be transparent with you. 
if you let me. In 2009, 2009, I sat at the desk of a Ford car dealership on the morning filling out my paperwork to go into full-time car sales. I remember the date because it was August 9th, 2009. And on August 9th, 1989. So I stood in the fellowship hall of this church and preached my first sermon. Don't clap yet. My, my life was in disarray. I had planted a church that didn't go well, had to shut it down. My marriage was faltering on its way to divorce. I didn't have the finances to meet my responsibilities at the end of every month. And here I found myself in car sales. I put on a suit on Sundays, look important, I'm Reverend Banks. I'd go places and I'd look for opportunities to preach, but they weren't coming too strong because I found myself in car sales. As I, as I filled out the paperwork, Clayton, listen, I remember sitting there and talking with God and said, well, God, it's been 20 years. It's a good run. I've been preaching 20 years. It's a good run. Maybe now at this phase of my life, I'm just doing something different. Exactly. Can make good money, take care of my family and sales. Maybe it's a transition. Oh, I'm gonna settle into being a car salesman. Yeah. Never forget, guy. I heard it as clearly as I'm hearing my voice right now. God said, never forget. You're not a car salesman who preaches. You're a preacher who sells cars. The dream wouldn't leave me alone. When it looked like there was no more opportunity, When I'd come to the end and said, maybe this is it. God said, like I said to Jeremiah, before I formed you, I knew you. And I called you. And no matter what it looks like right now, don't forget the dream. You didn't come up with the dream. It's God's dream. And I know it looks rough, but this dream has some audacity. This dream will look at your problems and say, I'm bigger than you. And this dream says, it's not just about you. It's bigger than your life. You know the reason why? Number 45, the commander in tweet has gotten more credible criticism, and this might be the death nail in his coffin. Yeah. It's because he's messing with folks' dreams of their future. Yeah. It's one thing to mess with me. It's one thing to mess with my life. But when you mess with my kids, you mess with the dreams of some children. Everybody gets upset because children ought to have a chance. He's messing with your future. The Lord sent me by to tell somebody, it doesn't matter what the devil has said to your life. It doesn't matter what you've been through. It doesn't matter how dark it's been. It doesn't matter what the devil has tried to prophesy about your future. God says my dream is bigger than your problem. can't die 
die. It won't die. It's going to haunt you until you get back in line and say it may be the 48th time. I may have failed 47 times before, but I'm going to sign back up. Pay the money to take the test. Give it my best and leave it in God's hands. Come on, give God some praise. Come on, give God some praise. Come on, give God some praise. You come too far to turn back now. You come too far to stop right here. You're not qualified to quit. God says keep on going. Keep on trusting. Keep on believing. He will turn it around. I'm a living witness. I'm a living witness that God will turn it around. I don't sell cars no more. I could if I wanted to, but I ain't got to. I don't sell cars no more because I didn't settle in a place that wasn't meant for me to settle. Don't settle right here. God's got a dream for your life. <laughs>